Welcome, everybody. I'm Felicity Barringer. I'm the writer in residence at the Bill Lane Center for the American West. And we're going to have a terrific program. We're going to hold off the start of it for just a couple of uh, minutes or less to uh, let uh, latecomers come in so they don't miss anything. But we'll be with you in just a second. All right, a few more people have joined us and I think it's best that we uh, go ahead now. Again, um, I'm Felicity Barringer. I'm the writer in residence at the Bill Lane Center for the American West. And it gives me great pleasure today to welcome Richard Neville and Stephen Nightingale, who are gonna discuss their new book, The Paradise Notebooks, um, along and they're gonna be joined in the discussion and it will be led by Professor Nicole Ardouin um, who will get the conversation going to talk some about the development of pro-environmental behavior. Richard Neville serves as the deputy director of the Earth Systems Program at Stanford, where he is uh, dedicated to the intellectual formation of the next generation of interdisciplinary social environmental change makers. As a senior lecturer in the program, Richard received Stanford's highest teaching honor. Richard has authored numerous scientific articles and is the co-author of the book of today's uh, program, The Paradise Notebook. Stephen Nightingale is the other co-author of The Paradise Notebooks, um, and he has written novels, sonnets, and long essays. Uh, yes, I got that right. Um, his interests include the medieval art of Spain and Italy, the wild country of the American West and the Caribbean, cooking with his wife and daughter, astronomy, venture capital, the quantitative arts, which are good if you're in, into venture capital, and Emily Dickinson, which is good no matter what you're into. He <laughs> divides his time between Palo Alto and his beloved home state of Nevada, uh, and the, I'm gonna mispronounce this, the Albazine, a barrio in Granada, Spain. Professor Nicole Ardouin, is the Sykes Family Director and the Emmett Interdisciplinary of excuse me of the Emmett Interdisciplinary Program in Environment and Resources, otherwise known to its friends as EIPER. She is an associate professor in the Graduate School of Education and a senior fellow at the Woods Institute for the Environment. Professor Ardois and her social ecology lab group research and her social ecology lab, excuse me, group research motivations for and barriers to environmental behavior at both individual and collective scales. Mm -hmm. Professor Ardouin is also the associate editor of the journal Environmental Education Research. She's a trustee of the George P. Storer Foundation, chair of Nature Bridges Executive, sorry, Nature Bridges Education Advisory Council, an advisor to the Student Conservation Association and Teton Science Schools, among other areas of service we wouldn't have any time to have this program if I listed everything that she was doing. <laughs> the Lane Center is really pleased to have these esteemed guests this afternoon. Nicole, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. I really appreciate it. I am so delighted to be here this afternoon for this conversation. And I'd like to congratulate Richard and Stephen on this beautiful new book. I have a copy with me here today. And as you can see, I've got many sticky notes in it. It has been such a pleasure to read through it. This book came out last month and it tells the story of two families, Richard, Stephen, their partners and their daughters on an extended backpacking trip together. When I say extended, I mean extended. This trip covered 90 miles over 13 days across the Sierra Nevada from west to east. And the structure of the book is unusual. It's uniquely engaging. It unfolds in a series of conversations so that you feel that you're joining them on their journey. It includes 21 pairs of writings, essays, and poems in a gorgeously designed book that also includes artwork from a Stanford Earth Systems alumni, Matthias Lennis. 
And each chapter has you feeling as if you're on their journey, experiencing the daily joys and tribulations in such a, a rich and rigorous undertaking, deepening our understanding of the Sierras and of yourself and your place in the world at the same time. Each chapter includes bits and pieces from Richard's diary, it includes beautiful poetry from Stephen, and it truly is a joy to read. So Stephen and Richard, could you tell us a little bit about the genesis of this project? How did you go from taking a hike, a, an extended hike, to developing a book together? Well, Nicole, first of all, thank you so much for, for being here and engaging with us in this conversation and being willing to go with us on this journey today. I'm just so appreciative. Um, I know that we're going to have a really rich conversation. I can't thank you enough. Um, and I also wanna thank all of the staff of the Lane Center for, for helping to, to make this happen today. You know, Stephen and I, you know, were in a somewhat hallucinogenic state, and I think it was around the twelfth day of our backpacking trip. Uh, we would wake up every morning. We were the, always the first ones up. We would have coffee. We would have a ch chance to muse, talk about books we loved. Uh, Stephen would op often recite poetry. We were maybe one day in, or rather about the thirteenth day in. We had had come up over a, a ridge line. And I just out of the out of the blue, I suggested to Stephen, you know, what an extraordinary conversation uh, we were having. I was off pointing out various aspects of the natural history. Stephen would respond in kind, bring in some uh, some uh, some uh, insight from his deep readings in spiritual writing and as well as poetry. And I, I wanted to continue this conversation. And so I tried to reel Stephen in to the idea of wanting of turning this this conversation into a book. And that was really the genesis. And I'm Steve, I, I know that I've not told the whole story here. I'm sure there's things you'd like to add. Well, I, uh, I think the context is that this in fact was uh, a, uh, a, a kind of harebrained, death-defying, <laughs> and uh, an unusually conceived and executed hike and but and but it, but it, it resulted because we were you know we were going over up ice chutes on crampons and uh, we were going you know deep into river canyons and then back over passes um, there's a um, I would call it a special exhaustion of the body that is a kind of a whole thoroughgoing physical fever almost that results in a kind of liberation of mind. Uh, and it's reflected, I think, in the kind of conversations we had on, on the trail. And it, what, what was so encouraging about the prospect of writing this book together was in fact the nature of the conversations that Richard and I were having. Um, the art of conversation, I think, is something that uh, is deep uh, in the roots of the mind as to the potential benefits that it can offer. And it really did seem to me that the conversations that Richard and I were having were um, the kind that we all seek. That is, they were the kind where, in defiance of the laws of arithmetic, one and one make four, one and one make five. Um, that is, we were conceiving things together that we could not have uh, otherwise approached uh, on our own. And, and as we were breaking down the barriers between minds, it, it, there was also uh, diminishment in barriers between uh, all of us and the surround beauties of the natural world of the Sierra. So, um, so one thing led, led to another, and there was a, a fitness between our conversations um, that led to the weaving together of our reflections um, all throughout this book, uh, and the weaving together of our experience um, with that of the reader and that of, uh, of the Sierra Nevada itself. So it all, you know, there was, there were there were many threads and uh, and they they came together to make the book you have in your hand. Thank you for that beautiful story. And I and I uh, well actually I was just going to say that I know my internet connection is a little bit unstable, so I'm turning off my video for the moment. But it's actually perfect timing because I'm hoping that the two of you can share um, some readings with us as we get started. So as we begin our conversation, I think it might be helpful for our 
for guests today to hear some of the beautiful words that you all have crafted and uh, to hear it directly in your voice. I, as I noted, I have all these sticky notes in here and I was going to jump in and read, but I realized that you reading it is much more powerful than if I were to read it. So uh, I would love to invite the two of you to share some of your favorite passages with us today. Yeah, Great. thank you, Nicole. Um, so the way that Steve and I approached writing the book was we chose a series of topics and I would usually take the first pass. And so what we're going to do here in the, maybe the first brief excerpt from the book is is try to give you a little bit of flavor of that conversation. Uh, the first part of the book is called Stone, Fire, Water, and it deals with what many would consider the inanimate elements of the Sierra Nevada, but we consider them to be animate. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read uh, a short excerpt from the beginning of our chapter on rivers, and I'm going to pass the torch over to Stephen so you can see how he's responding to some of the some of the aspects of the natural science and the natural the natural history of, of rivers. So I'll, I'll start with this brief excerpt from the chapter on, on rivers. And I'm also going to choose it too because uh, this chapter also introduces us a little bit to the physical phenomenon that is the Sierra Nevada. River. The Sierra Nevada is an immense curving spine of rock winding 400 miles down the length of California. A profile cut across the range reveals a ramp. It eases up from California's central valley to the mountain's frost-riven crest, then plummets down a steep escarpment to the sage-brushed scrubland of the Great Basin. Yet such geometric description of the range is only abstraction. For the Sierra Nevada is alive, sheathed in a skin of soil and forests, veined with green canyons holding cold rivers in indigo shadows. Rivers have sawn down through the mountains, cutting to the quick of the range's granitic interior, drawing the mountains down in an unending litany of clattering cobbles, tumbling sand, gritty silt, and dust. Rivers have ferried all matter of fragmented stone to the yawning Central Valley, on to the muddy Bay of San Francisco, and into the dark, dreaming chasm of the Pacific Ocean. Now, before California was California, some 100 million years ago, the primeval forebearer of the Pacific Ocean lapped against what is today the Sierra's western edge, into this shallow sea Ancestral rivers unloaded their hulls of Sierra and rock in such quantity that the sea floor sagged and sank under the accumulating weight. Remnants of the river ferried and ocean sifted sediments are stacked between the Sierra and the coast ranges in a bulging wedge of rock up to six miles thick. The volume of it might fill the Grand Canyon 25 times over. Yet still, this mass says nothing of the Sierra's remains that were gorged out by rivers, dumped into the ancestral Pacific Ocean, and then dragged down into the Earth's incandescent interior, along the conveyor belt of subduction, that engine that drives the slow process of tectonic churning by which the planet consumes its rocky skin, regenerates the contours of its surface, closes and opens its ocean basins and draws its land masses together to build continents only to divide them later from within, which is to say that most of the Sierra has gone down the river. And, uh, and Nicole, here, here is my companion essay to, uh, to Richard's beautiful uh, evocation of the rivers of the Sierra. We began our hike knowing that it had been a big winter and that massive snow drifts in the mountains had turned rivulets into rocketing creeks and rivers into threatening torrents. Before we began hiking, we knew that already three hikers had drowned in the Kern. Our route had many watercourses that we had meant to walk simply and easily across. 
Now a coursing and tossing of fresh currents confronted us at every single crossing. And we had to reconnoiter up Canyon and down Canyon to find a way forward that would not kill us. It carried the terror of knowing the precise number of mistakes allowed, one and one only. My balance is poor. More than once I crawled slowly like a clumsy lizard over tree trunks. Our two daughters though, leapt up easily upon those same trunks and walked straight across with insouciance and exquisite balance for all the world as if they were out on a Sunday promenade. The culmination was unforgettable, unbearable beauty and the presence of death. Emily Dickinson wrote, Nicole, you mentioned Emily Dickinson and of course her sentences are in my head every day. Emily Dickinson wrote, those that are worthy of life are of miracle, for life is a miracle, and death harmless as a bee, except to those who run. We did not run. We tried to learn. What stayed with us was the power of water and its movement, which is irresistible, mountain making, and on the move with a force of revelation. As rivers shape the material of the Sierra, so does the arcing and concentrated movement of our ideas, actions, and spirit shape our days, shape our months. It is as if a river is a teacher. And what it teaches is to follow a course forward based upon a river's ancient recommendations, a suppleness of mind, a communion with land, a certainty of joy, an openness to light, and a surety of destination. Thank you both. That was so beautiful. And uh, wow, um, just you know, listening to both of you, what really strikes me is how much do you speak to the sense of reverence and wonder that comes from attending carefully to the world around you. And in my lab, the social ecology lab that was mentioned earlier here at Stanford, we've been undertaking studies for the past five or so years in California's redwood forest, a bit of a different ecosystem than where you were. And we've been seeking to better understand these processes and phenomena of awe and wonder that you described so beautifully. We've been trying to understand through both qualitative and quantitative data, how and under what conditions those experiences that people have in, in redwood forests and redwood ecosystems might lead people to undertake place protective behaviors or pro-environmental behaviors and, uh, and, and the ways that these experiences of joy and, and reverence and wonder that you've just described might lead people to feel protective of those places. So I am curious with the two of you, based on your experiences while writing this book or while undertaking your journey, what are your thoughts on that relationship between this deepening sense of awe and, and wonder and, and, and even Stephen, you just described kind of a sense of, of fear and reverence mm -hmm. and the desire to take care of and protect these special places such as the Sierras. Mm -hmm. Nicole, thank you so much for that question. And you know, as we as we answer, I'm I'd be curious to hear from you also about how what we have on offer here resonates with what you've learned through your research. But I'll, maybe I'll just share a, a little bit of a vignette or a story. Uh, you know, I know that Stephen has a long relationship with both the Great Basin and the Sierra Nevada, and you know, I talk about in the in the preface of the book, you know, how my first encounter, my first 
physical encounter with the Sierra Nevada was actually uh, coming out to Stanford as a young man um, in my early 20s for graduate school. Uh, and we had driven from Massachusetts, my then girlfriend at the time, who later became my partner, uh, my life partner, uh, we drove across the Sierra Nevada and I saw the mountains for the first time. Uh, I had fallen in love with mountains as a young child uh, going out on a camping trip to West Texas. And there was a way in which they opened up a kind of curiosity, a sense of uh, a numinous presence. Um, I grew up in a very you know, observant Catholic household, but there was a way in which being among mountains felt even more, uh, of a, of a, gave me even a, a, a deeper sense of of a divinity of a different kind than I was learning about um, through uh, through my Catholic upbringing, but one that was you know not maybe that different from it. But I think you know ultimately, Nicole, you know, as I was a graduate student at Stanford in the in the uh, late '80s and early '90s, we were just starting to talk about uh, in dis interdisciplinary environmental science. That's when the Earth Systems Program was founded. Um, it was at that that time that I was having my environmental awakening, as becoming aware of the great ecological and environmental challenges that we face. And ultimately the Sierra for me came a, became a place of something I began to develop a long relationship with partly during graduate school. After my daughter was born, we would take my wife and I would take her up every single summer, uh, partly just for like a vacation, but it was more than that to me. It felt like a retreat. It felt like a place where I could reinvigorate my connection with the natural world and in a sense, draw the strength I needed to, you know, to engage with, uh, in, you know, uh, doing science on a world that is profoundly suffering. So there's a sense in which the Sierra Nevada gave me a gift and gave me the spiritual strength to continue to, you know, have hold, as I write in the book, both grief and hope at the same time. Um, you know, it's not that the Sierra is in any way immune to the larger environmental challenges that we're seeing happening across the planet. There's a way in which its resilience, uh, its ancientness, uh, the way that it exists on a human, a, a, a time scale that is not human, um, that gave me a sense of something that's much greater than myself. And so that's why, among many reasons, I return to the Sierra every summer. Um, and the book in some ways is actually a love letter. It's a letter of gratitude to a place that continues to give me strength in the work that I do um, at Stanford with our students that we're trying to train to go out and help us continue to solve these challenges. And, uh, Nicole, we, you know, it's so interesting that, that you bring up this, this, the word wonder, um, because of course that is a kind of iconic emotion that we have when we're in beautiful places. Um, and, and it, it leads it leads my mind to a, a subject which I've been contemplating a lot recently, which is there's a host of words, wonder, beauty, grace, understanding, love, friendship, um, which are fundamentally experiential, but which are very difficult to define. And so part of Part of what uh, we were trying to do in the book was actually to bring the resources of language to the words that we use and want to use, which connect us to life, which about which we want to have some idea of what their real meaning is, uh, how um, we can use language in order to understand better these words which portray uh, and enliven and make real our connection with life. Um, I mean, for example, one, wonder and beauty um, are linked up in, in my mind. And in, in the book, I, I have a, a definition of beauty and it runs like this. Beauty is a lucid and graceful assembly of forms that calls the mind close to life, our bodies close to the earth, and all of us closer to one another. That, that definition uh, is in the book because it evokes a kind of 
unity that Richard and I felt with the Sierra Nevada, which is a unity that any of us can feel um, as we come into communion with the natural world. And it's, um, it's, it's such a fascinating um, and it's project to have a shared effort which has as one of its goals to bring the language to those parts of human experience, which um, the words for which we know, but the meaning of which is not always accessible to us. And so it's, it's in the nature of clarity. It's an effort of understanding. And it's a, an invitation to the reader to join with us uh, in that shared understanding. I, I love that. I think that's a really interesting point. I, I have to say, I'm, I'm also, as you're, as you're describing that, I'm also reflecting on some of the work that we've done in our group um, in, in exploring notions of awe, which has been fascinating. It's such a complex experience. And some of the work that we've done around it, we've been trying to explore it, as I mentioned, quantitatively and qualitatively. Mm -hmm. And one of the challenges with a word such as awe is, as I think you described in your in your reading, Stephen, we often think of it as having only positive connotations. And yet there is also the other side of that, which which can be either fear or danger or this sense of challenge that comes with it. And uh, and so we notice, for example, in people experiencing, whether it's a, it's a redwood forest or experiencing a, a challenging and, and persevering through difficulty, awe can also come from those kinds of experiences. And I think that wonder is perhaps one of, one of those other words that can have a lot of different dimensions to it as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it does also make me reflect on, I wasn't actually planning to go to this question next, but maybe I will jump there. Uh, the, the kind of the marriage of social sciences, natural sciences, humanities uh, that you all bring to this work. And I think that, that part of the, uh, the beauty in this book is that you all have brought to bear all these different fields and perspectives on these complex topics. And so for example, in the humanities, there are so many different ways of looking at these complex topics. I wonder if you all could talk about that. That's something that I know you set out at the beginning of the book and then really have tried to bring that thread the whole way through. Um, so I wonder if you could speak to that. And then, well, and then I've got a second follow-up question, but I'll save that for just a minute. Okay. Yeah, maybe I'll just jump in quickly and then pass it to Steve here. But, you know, Nicole, I, again, I, uh, I'm i thinking about a story or of an encounter that I, I had a few years ago. So I think, you know, both you and I kind of come uh, I know that you studied art history as an undergraduate and you came to the social sciences indirectly. And I think I was also similarly inclined as a young high school student, very much passionate about the visual arts, but I found my way into the geological sciences. Um, I think there's a way in which, uh, you know, one's attraction to the natural world can be both as a, you know, a, someone who is curious in a feral way, but also drawn in a, an aesthetic way to the natural world. So I came by both of those honestly, but I, I think, you know, trained as a scientist, I, I unlearned a lot of, of, of sort of how to communicate that aesthetic draw. That was not really, it's not really allowed in the sciences so much. And I think I started to unlearn that about 10 years ago, and it was on a trip up to Tuolumne Meadows where I began to, I met several interpretive naturalists who work for the National Park Service. There's an incredible teaching community up in Tuolumne Meadows. And what I saw there is the way in which they integrated teaching about natural history, but also bringing in songs and poetry uh, as a way of, of helping people connect with the, not just their minds, but also with their hearts and with the fullness of their humanity. And it was in that moment, I actually began, began to become uh, very good friends with a couple of those ranger naturalists. And I was so awed by talk about awe, I was awed by the way that they were bringing together the sciences and humanities as a way to help the public connect with this place, this extraordinary place with their full humanity. And suddenly 
I had the license and the permission once again to incorporate the arts in my own field classes that I teach here at Stanford. And so I designed a whole class around that. But then I think it continued to grow. And when Steve and I were talking in the mountains, I thought this is an opportunity for us to to try to embark on a similar project, especially with Stephen's, you know, long investment in 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 English literature and other literatures, in fact, and also his practice as a poet. And I just saw an opportunity to collaborate and bring uh, a telling of the place that embraced both the sciences, but also but also the humanities and spirituality and poetry as well. So that's a little story that helps you to understand, you know, it, it's some there's a way in which we can connect with and appreciate the natural world that is enriched by when we are able to bring uh, the fullness of our humanity to it. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, these are, all, Nicole, these are, I hope we could talk all afternoon, Nicole, these are, these are with you. These are such interesting subjects and your questions are so interesting. I, I um, this fragmentation of mind that is part of our education that separates the sciences and the humanities um, is, is something that needs to be healed. There's a rift there that is unnatural and, uh, and, uh, and is not on the favor of, in favor of life is not in, in favor of deepening our connections with life. So part of the book we have written is an attempt to heal that fragmentation, to bring a new unity to scientific contemplation um, and spiritual initiative, um, because they're, they're in fact directly related. Um, and it, it's also related to, to something that, that you, you brought up, which is that wonder and awe can have an element of fear, um, which sharpens and enlivens the whole experience. But, but it's worth looking at that, I think, and, 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 and exploring it. And one thing I think that it, it is legitimate to say is one of the sources of that fear is that when we're in a surround of beauties in the natural world, we are the recipient of infinite gifts with a kind of infinite generosity. And they're all given to us wholeheartedly and with complete liberty. And so the question is, how are we to respond to that? What's the, what's the right response? Well, part of that response has to be that we yield ourselves. We give ourselves back to the natural world. And there, that yielding, which is a kind of, um, involves a kind of renunciation of the self, can be very, uh, make people very anxious. Because, you know, there's this, especially if people have a very strong sense of identity, to give up that uh, identity in favor of a communion with the natural world is sometimes very difficult to do. But part of what we're trying to convey is that it's necessary, that's an important, that it's in the name of life, it's in favor of unity, that, it, that it's uh, an essential precondition of, of, uh, of communion. And it brings to mind a quote, which I happen to have at hand, uh, randomly, um, from Albert Einstein. Uh, he said, the true value of a human being is determined primarily by the measure and the sense in which he or she has attained liberation from the self. And isn't that a beautiful line? Um, I think that, of course, giving up oneself can cause pain and anxiety and difficulty and reluctance. But what happens is it gives us access to another kind of knowledge that is deeply connected to life and, uh, and is maybe one of the essential elements in this transformation, this cultural transformation that we need if we're to 
um, come into the right kind of reverence and respect for the natural world and work in communion with it rather than in defiance of it. Wow, what a, what a thoughtful and powerful response. That is so, that's so intriguing. And uh, and I, I have even more questions now than, than where I did at the beginning. Um, <laughs> Good, we hope. Uh, yes, I, I agree. We could we can continue talking all afternoon, and and I hope uh, actually I hope that all of you who are with us uh, are are percolating questions here. Feel free to enter them into the into the chat. We look forward to hearing from all of you. I noticing our time here. I have one um, one question I'm going to throw out now, and that I think will will turn to another reading. Um, although I do I do have a lot of other questions, but one element, especially that was just sparked in what you said, Stephen, and that also is something near and dear to my heart as I read this book, is the core theme of that, that uh, I would say that recursive relationship with people and place and how, how place makes people and how people make place. Uh, as, as you know, Richard, this has been a central theme in my work for more than two decades. And, and I suspect that's perhaps why, one of the reasons why you invited me to join in this conversation with you. And I, and I thank you for that. And so in our lab, when we talk about sense of place and connection to place, we emphasize that it's not just about biophysical place. So of course, being in a beautiful place like the Sierra Nevadas where you all were, we often, we often think about place when we're in, in places like that. But it also includes other critical and experiential dimensions, such as those that Stephen just mentioned. We, we talk about the psychological dimension of place. How do I think of myself in relation to this place? How does this place make me? the sociocultural aspects of place, which are so critical, and the political and economic dimensions of place. And so in our group, we do a lot of studying of what how all those dimensions come together to actually form what, it, what, what a place is. And interestingly, in our studies where we've worked in a variety of settings, both urban, suburban, and rural, we've worked in domestic US and, and many international settings, and, and our studies repeatedly find the importance of the social dimension to place, which comes through so strongly in this book. And indeed, one of my favorite quotes is by geographer Yi Fu Tuan, who famously said that space becomes place when we interact with it and we imbue it with meaning. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious from the two of you, how you think your experience was influenced by undertaking your adventure, your journey in a group of six rather than imagining if you know, if you'd gone out, if you'd struck out as individuals taking this journey, or even if just the two of you had gone, but rather than doing that, you went with your partners, you went with your, your daughters who were 16. I, I was particularly intrigued by that. I have a daughter who's in that same age range. Uh, <laughs> so wondering how, how, that, how that changed your experience of, of this place. Well, Nicole, I think, you know, one thing that's so interesting about, about taking 16 year old daughters across the Sierra is that they're much faster than you. Um, and they, they move much more agilely. <laughs> I think it's one observation. And I would say that another observation that had they written this book, it would have had been very different. different. And I, you know, my daughter has not read the book yet. And uh, I know that she'll look at me and say, that's what you took away from our trip. So I think, you know, one of the things that you really, you speak to is the way in which you know, our sense of place is socially constructed. And one of the ways that we socially construct that that sense of connection and place is through stories and stories that we remember and stories that we change and, and after we, we leave that place. You know, I, I as you were asking that question, I couldn't help but think of uh, an earlier life in which I was quite young, right out of college. Uh, it was my first job. I was a field assistant working in really remote regions in Peru. Um, and some of that time I was alone in these extraordinary landscapes. Uh, and I, as as much as in wonder and awe I was at those landscapes, for the times that I was there when I was working alone, I profound, I felt, remember feeling profoundly lonely. I wanted the opportunity to share these beautiful places in the world with others, uh, with people I loved. I had specific people in mind, but I also had, you know, people I, I dreamed about, like I would like to be with. Uh, so there's a way in which you know this there's this an innate or inborn desire to want to to be able to experience these places with others. One of the things that we had a chance to do is form a set of memories 
uh, and jokes and stories that we can always tell about the place that we were in. In some ways, that relationship with place in my family has been built over a period of several decades or two decades in which we've traveled and there are, there are stories that we, we go back to over and over again. Uh, but there's also places in which there's also an, another kind of relationship. And I've been thinking about this idea about how sense of place is socially constructed uh, with others. But there's also a way in which I feel in which the land speaks to us and or we perhaps project or imbue meaning to the place that's already in us. And it provides just the right projection screen that we need at the right time to help us come to an understanding that's in ourselves. So there's a way, if it's possible, that we socially engage with landscapes. I think it's our nature to want to, to try to relate to, to other animals, to trees, to mountains, to whole ecosystems and landscapes. So I think there's a way in which we, for lack of a better way of describing it, are invited by places to engage. Uh, and and so we are such social animals that we can't help ourselves. We're in a, you know, in an inanimate landscape. Hmm. What well, you know, uh, Nicole, this this uh, having two 16 year old daughters, both of whom uh, I am here to tell you are much smarter than their fathers. <laughs> <laughs> having having two 16 year old daughters, it really was uh, comical. And it's one of the reasons we have so many laughs. When we remember the trip. It was like two gazelles and four pack animals. <laughs> <laughs> they sort of bounded, you know, over the pass, and we would show up at uh, at our campsite an hour later. Um, but you know, this this social uh, this element of the social is is fascinating, and, and it brings to mind a couple of things. And one of them is in relation to to our daughters. That is, you know, you have. Uh, a baby girl, and of course, you know, as a father, you want to immediately think of all the things you want to teach them as they grow up and as their minds develop. And then you find at some point that you had that totally wrong. It's totally backwards. They're the teacher, and 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 we're the students. And um, there's, I think, there's an analogy in 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 the as we go into wild places like the Sierra or any place in the natural world, you know, we, we can, we, we go there and we bring ourselves, we bring our consciousness, we bring our learning, but we're really there as students. We're really there to be in the presence of a place which, as, as Richard has touched on, is not at all inanimate. Um, the natural world is conscious. There's no other way to put it. It is conscious, and it, we share life with it. And so we're, we're there, and we need to make ourselves available as students to this infinity of gift giving that comes our way as a result of, of being there. So part of, and it relates to what I was saying uh, earlier about yielding oneself to a place, just as you yield your, yourself to someone that you love. Um, we wanted to be, we wanted to be good students and we wanted to be messengers of this place. That is, we wanted to be able to write in such a way that we could we could understand as well as possible the gifts given us, and then turn around and hand them directly to the reader. Um, we wanted to be, you know, my the image in my head is that Richard and I wanted to be transparent in a certain way so that the reader could see the Sierra Nevada and share our experience um, and look straight through us into that, uh, that compound and offering and uh, splendor of beauties. So it's, uh, it relates to that, that vanishing, that metaphor I keep coming back to. You know, I just want to add one more point, Stephen. You made me think of something and the way it, re it relates to the way in which this book at least part of what might motivated me to want to write it was to to share a certain view a view and a 
a way of connecting with the Sierra Nevada with people I love. My mother, for example, who can't go visit these places, but also I take students to Sierra Nevada. I wanted to give them something that they could that would help them connect to a place I've taken them to or for those who might not be able to get there ever for a way in which you know to, to kind of extend that experience that sense of place even to people who can't visit that place uh, because I think there's ways in which we relate or develop senses of place that are universal to many places wherever they they could be in neighborhood parks they could be even in a little park strip in which there's some kind of wild uprising of of wildflowers. I see it here on the Stanford campus as you're coming in, you know, these wildflowers are just, they're truly wild. So there's a way in which the wild, a big wildness like the Sierra Nevada can also be experienced in little more intimate uh, uh, scales, even in, even within, you know, the busyness and the concrete jungle of an urban place. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's just to, just to add one thing onto that, uh, Nicole, you know, it, it's to, to use a different metaphor, it, it's the developing of a capacity. That is, it, it's the development of, of a capacity to come into communion with the place, to um, enter into the beauties there, and then to be able to turn around and give those very beauties away. And once you have that capacity, you can exercise it anywhere. Uh, I, I say in one of the uh, one of the introductions to my books of sonnets, even the passage of light through a glass of water is an occasion of beauty and of splendor. Um, so it can happen anywhere. It can happen at any time. I I love it. I love it. And I have to say, I, I said that that last one was my last question, but I was lying because that that is such a great <laughs> invitation. I can't stand it. <laughs> and I'm, hesi I'm hesitant to end my my question in this portion with a spoiler, but I, but I have to do it because it's toward the end of the book. And Stephen, you, uh, toward the end of the book, you reflect on your, what you call your two journeys. You talk about your journey during your hike, and then you talk about the journey that you also took while writing the book. Mm -hmm. And as you're reflecting on it, uh, you have a quote in here. You say, quote, all we did is take a walk, but any walk can be a participation in the sacred. This mm -hmm. is some of what we learned. Miracle is common and daily. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I'm particularly intrigued by that. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering if the two of you can speak to that, which I think you just did with your comments. And I'm wondering if you can perhaps speak to our, to our group today about mm -hmm. how you would share with what your journeys were and how they might find these common and daily miracles. Yeah, Nicole, thank you. I, uh, you know, to, to sort of riff off of what Stephen was saying and thinking about a practice that I have just stumbled into, you know, Tom Fleischner, who was a, he was a former director of the Natural History Institute and an ecologist at Prescott College. You know, he writes a lot about natural history, thinks a lot about natural history, uh, both as a scientific practice, as one something that opens us up to asking questions about the natural world, but it's also a kind of spiritual practice and a kind of necessarily healing uh, for our severed relationship with the natural world. But one of the words that Tom uses a lot that Stephen spoke of uh, in describing the movement of light through a glass of water is the notion of receptiveness. Uh, you know, when I am out, uh, I can escape my little office here in the Y2E2 building on the Stanford campus. One of the things that's really lovely about this campus is that there's, there's little pockets of wild uh, in which we inhabit this space with wild animals. Uh, one of the most obvious ones, in addition to the, the plants, uh, which are domesticated, but many of them are wild species, are birds. And I think birds are a gateway drug for people to connect to the natural world. They're around us. They share the space that we inhabit <sighs> and their lives ex coexist with us. And so that's one of the ways that I've been able to celebrate everyday miracle that is common, but no less miraculous or mysterious are the lives of birds who co who who've who've lived with us as long as we've existed as a species and long before that and so i'm constantly transported little moments of the day whenever i encounter a bird even if it's a very common bird like the juncos that are all over campus but there's wildness around us and we have great horned owls we have raccoons we have opossums so even in a you know in an urban environment we have uh, we we live at the same time with more than human kin who invite us to celebrate the miracle, the miracle that is life at all, 
Uh, and I think when we start to do that, we start to develop a different relationship. It changes how we interact with the world and invites us to this the kind of probe environmental behavior that we, that we study. We are not here alone. The, the earth is not just for us. It is with us for a time. Uh, we share it with others and we have a responsibility to take care of it so that it can be appreciated and enjoyed uh, by others who will follow. Uh, and I think there's nothing like spending time looking at birds that helps us to remember that every day. Maybe that's why there's so many chapters about birds in the book. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, I, I think this, uh, a very common notice, uh, a, a very common metaphor in mystical writing is the metaphor of, of homecoming. And that's, that's, that's another way to uh, portray what Richard and I are trying to um, convey here, which is the, the need for all of us, if we were to be fully alive, to, for there to be a kind of homecoming to earth. A homecoming to earth is a homecoming to life. And, and it's a matter of that capacity that we were speaking of earlier. It's a matter of intuition. Um, Emily Dickinson, to bring our beloved Emily back into this, has this wonderful line in her letters, uh, which is that the sailor cannot see the north, but knows the needle can. So, you know, th there's this internal compass that we all have that orients us towards life. And, and we need to follow that. We need to follow that direction. Um, uh, a Sufi writer in, uh, in 14th century Spain um, has a wonderful line, which is one of the epigraphs in the book, which, which runs, heaven makes things easy, so do not make them difficult. <laughs> and isn't that wonderful? Um, and, you know, among the Sufis, it, it is one of their conceptions, which is a, a, one of the mystical, great mystical practices on earth. Among the Sufis, it's, it's a commonplace that miracle is continuous. All around us, miracle is continuous. And that links up, I think, very beautifully with traditions in other faiths. Um, in the Gospel of Thomas, um, where... Uh, Jesus is really much more of a kind of mystical teacher than he, he is uh, uh, a, a, an incarnate God. They ask him, they say, they say, they say, when will the kingdom of heaven come to earth? And he replies, the kingdom of heaven is spread out in the air before you, and yet you do not see it. So this conscious presence of the natural world with all its boundless gift giving is something available to us every minute of every day and in our dreams, in all our dreams it's present. And, it, and that's such a hopeful thing. It's such a, it's such a, it gives one in concept even such a sense of deliverance and of hope and possibility and promise. That is, that is so hopeful. Thank you so much. I, I would encourage people who are with us today, if you'd like to add any questions in the, in the chat, and I'm going to invite the two of you to share a final reading before we turn to any questions that show up. So in our yeah. last few minutes, we'll, we'll end with the reading uh, or turn to any questions after that reading. Thank you, Nicole. I'm, I'm going to share uh, an excerpt from our last chapter. Uh, and Steve, like we did before, we'll, we'll We'll do. Uh, we'll share a bit of his essay uh, and some poetry that he wrote to accompany this piece. So this is the last chapter in the book. So the the first half of the book is stone, fire, water. The second book is a little bit of a play on words from, you know, John Muir's moniker for the Sierra Nevada, which is the range of light. So our second our second section of the book is called range of life, and this is you know one of the things that makes the Sierra Nevada so extraordinary is the profound biodiversity of the range. And so in that second section of the book, we, we really focus in on ecological relationships and individual species accounts. And so I'm going to share uh, the last uh, bit of the last chapter on the wolf lichen, which is quite common uh, in the mid elevations of the Sierra Nevada. Um, and so I'll, I'll share a bit of that. In the heart of the Sierra's red fir forest, wolf lichen clings to the old bulls like red, like thick fur intensely chartreuse, almost incandescent, used variably to kill, to heal, and to bestow beauty, 
Wolf lichen lives for itself and brews poison for its protection. Though it can't defend itself against toxins we emit into our air, it still sends out a quiet warning. Wolf lichen anchors firmly to the bark of mature firs. Yet for most everything else, the lichen relies on itself. Or better said, the lichen relies on themselves. For lichens are a partnership of organisms, a fungus and a photosynthetic consort, a collaboration really, that fashions a communal being with a life more wondrous than either could achieve alone. The photosynthetic partner, either a cyanobacterium or an alga as it is in wolf lichen, produces food using sunlight. And for its part, the fungal partner builds the lichen structure and harvests moisture and nutrients from rain and mist and air. A third co-conspirator in some lichen communities is yeast, a kind of microscopic fungi. Lichens are monitors and messengers. As they capture nutrients from the atmosphere, they do so indiscriminately, absorbing whatever airborne pollutants happen to fall on them too. Sierra wolf lichens are bathed in a slew of wind-blown pesticides and pollutants produced by the incessant burning of fossil fuels. The lichens have tolerated these poisons so far. Their hardy persistence has enabled them to accumulate contaminants and thereby preserve records of pollutant deposition in the Sierra forests, even as less pollutant tolerant relatives of the wolf lichen have likely declined in the range. What is the forest? It's a web of relations, of light and trees and soil, of flying, crawling creatures, of fungal mycelia, and of clinging bodies of brilliantly hued lichen. The Sierra forest, every forest, is a kind of music, really, an improbable orchestral emergence, a song of life. When the strands in the web of forest relations stretch, and break, the song diminishes. The world could fall silent. Might we at least attend to the warning that is whispered by wolf lichen, this bright companion with whom we cling to earth. Thank this you, Richard. And we'll turn to Stephen. This is from my paired essay with uh, Richard's on wolf lichen. We all need somewhere to live on Earth. We need a place where we can learn together. Our support is the simple, necessary one, just as the wolf lichen relies on the bark of the fur for support, we rely on the physical world. Whether in the mountains, on the plains, along a coast, we have as our holdfast the Earth itself. We must answer the same question. How might we, in this very place, mindfully configure a life? How do we learn what activity or contemplation would give us the best chance to live, to give, to understand? What if just now, rather than turn to volumes of philosophy, studies of psychology, or spiritual texts, we give our attention to the wolf lichen. First, we can learn that we are not, as it were, ourselves. Just as the lichen is composed of cyanobacterial alga and a fungus with the addition of a yeast, we ourselves are composed of a host of life forms. A considerable portion of our body weight, as much as 10%, is composed of bacteria. Our cell structure incorporates richly and remarkably the whole biological history of coordination, of cooperation, of genetic change, of community evolution. We have the most intimate and powerful bonds, always and everywhere with all other life forms. We live in them, just as they live in us. Wolf Lichen offer this injunction, no how you are composed. Then take the next step and come to understand that none of us is alone. 
It is a physical fact that in the makeup of our bodies and at the root of the mind, we are unified with all other life. Where might this fact lead us? It leads us to the mischievous contemplation of all the other life forms we came across, whether in the Sierra or elsewhere. And I wanna offer some haiku, the beautiful traditional three line poetic form from Japan in celebration of some of these life forms. Old falcon, my fingertips on your wings. Cougar at last in the afternoon, we nap together. Hornets, may I wear your nest as a turban. Coyotes count me in, wool caper through the debutante balls. Bobcat, trust me, I pray, to babysit the kittens. Bat, take me with you for psychedelic acrobatics. Dragonfly, those colors. Are you professor of opals? Moth, your wings unlock every one of the doors of midnight. Water oozel, gray, small, plain, shy, packed with gods. Owl, fierce, vigilant, predatory. It's about joy. Meadowlark, without your song, spring would stay home and sulk. Hummingbird, sewing together the mind we need. <laughs> oh, I love haiku. Oh, my. <laughs> Those are magnificent. Oh, I love them. I, I can't wait to go back and read that again. <laughs> Thank you to so much. And and I reckon we have we have two questions. And although I will I will pass those to you afterward, I will just note that one of them was serendipitously just answered by the readings that you gave. One of them was whether you were amazed by the little life amidst the granite. And I believe that you just addressed that beautifully with your readings. So thank you so much. Great. And uh, and I will, I will close us out now. And, and I will start by thanking all of our guests who are here today joining us. Thanks so much to the Lane Center for the American West for hosting this phenomenal event. We hope this is a wonderful way to kick off the weekend for all of you. It certainly was for me. Thanks especially to Richard Neville and Stephen Nightingale for sharing their insights and their wisdom with us. We hope that each of you today leave inspired to discover the common daily miracles of your place. Thank you again. Thanks so much, Stephen and Richard. This has truly been a joy. Well, thank you, Nicole. My heavens. Thank you from the bottom of my heart, Nicole. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Take care. I look forward to seeing you soon. Oh, 